Well, praise God. Let's open with prayer, Father. We praise you and thank you. We pray for our nation. We pray for the church. We pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit will intervene in all the garbage that's going on in our nation and uh, and in the world. Father, It's uh, we've lived in kind of a bubble in America while people around the world have been fighting this kind of nonsense all over the world, and now it's kind of come home to roost. And, and I believe, Lord, it's because of the immoral state of our nation, um, the unethical people that are running it. We pray for our leaders. You tell us to pray for our leaders. It's very difficult in these times to pray for our leaders when it appears that they are doing so many evil things. Oh, it says in the Bible that the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. And I just feel like someone's come and stole the election, killing babies, and want to destroy American democracy. And uh, I just pray, Father God, that these hearts would be reversed and things would be changed. It's difficult to see these kind of hardened hearts to be changed, Father God, but when they can openly uh, condone murdering babies at such a rate to the point that they're doing it worldwide, they're financing it worldwide. And I just pray, Lord God, that, uh, that these people's hearts would be changed. And Father, pray for this message and the time that we're together here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, I want to confront one thing uh, that's been kind of bothering me, and I kind of feel like I found the solution to it. Um, and uh, so, prophecy update, March 5th, 2021. Many shall try to deceive many. Matthew 24, 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, He's talking at the Olivet Discourse. He's talking about the end times. Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Matthew 24, 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Well, things are getting crazy quickly. While there is a deluge of filth and violence presented to kids on the internet, the self-righteous lefties want to protect your children's fragile little minds from the likes of the evil Muppets, Kermit the Frog, Dr. Zeus, and Pepe Le Pew. And this week, some fool claiming to be a minister has called out Jesus for being a racist, um, specifically about the parable of the woman that comes and, and uh, wants her daughter healed. And Jesus said, "This is for the, <clears throat> this is for the, the family of God for the Jews." And um, she said, "Well, a dog at least gets the crumbs." And he said, "You have a lot of faith." And he allowed her daughter to be healed. But uh, so this guy, he's claiming that because of how Jesus did that, he's a racist. Well, obviously, as a ministry, he doesn't even understand the gospel or the compelling love of God. Um, in John, it said that the, the Israel actually rejected him, but all those who um, accepted him, he made them children of God. So that lady could easily become a child of God, and this guy just doesn't know the scriptures. Uh, he's nuttier than a fruitcake. Oh, wait, can I say that? Or is that somehow condemning an innocent cheesecake or fruitcake somewhere? But, um, well, anyhow, I have a whole sermon in mind about that topic, but today I want to speak to you, <clears throat> to you about the great apostasy. Um, to a church coming to a church near you. Um, the great apostasy, uh, you know, if you don't know it or not, I'm uh, <clears throat> by now, if you don't know it, I, my tendency is to be what, what is called pre wrath, more so than pre trib. And um, I was raised pre trib and uh, taught that my whole life. Uh, only believed it because someone told me that's what. It was going to do, and it sounded very compelling that we'd be taken out of here before anything bad began to happen. Sounds really good, but um, but uh, recently the pre-tribbers have come up with a new thing because because they've they've been, they've been cut off at so many passes. Um, the most the most clear one, and I don't know what a pastor would say or theologians would say about this, but there is nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible. Did I say nowhere in the Bible? There's nowhere in the Bible that says that there's a seven-year tribulation. It just ain't there. Jesus himself talks about a great tribulation that's three and a half years long, <clears throat> and it appears that that gets cut short. So, um, 
there is no seven year tribulation. So how could you be raptured out before the seven year tribulation if there's biblically no seven year tribulation? They confuse that with uh, the seventh week of Daniel. And somehow they've decided that that's uh, the day of the Lord. And it's not the day of the Lord it specifically calls out the day of the Lord later uh, after the end of the seven years. So anyway, let me read to you what, what's coming down the pike now by these guys because they're running into so many dead ends when people confront them. That they've got a new one. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians 2 1. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if it from, from as if from us as though the day of the Christ had come. Now, what's going on is <clears throat> Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, um, Thessalonians. Yeah, the, to, he's writing to the Thessalonians. Thessal <clears throat> Thessalonians and, um, and he's very specifically now brethren concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him um, sounds like the rapture to me sounds like he's talking about the rapture and uh, that's a pretty foregone conclusion that that this is all about the rapture because he goes on in chapter 4 and talks about when the dead in Christ arise and then the, those of us who are still alive be taken up and so um, but he's, he's telling them, don't be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or word or letter. Because they had come to the conclusion that possibly Christ had already come and taken the people he was going to take. And they're saying, like, what about us? So, But he, said, he goes on in verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the, <clears throat> the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, <clears throat> so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now that's pretty specific about who this guy is. But it says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So this is speaking of the Antichrist, or at that point, maybe he's, he would be the beast. But um, I have kind of a belief that by the time he gets to the temple, he's the beast. But um, let no one deceive you by any means. So that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Now... Having run out of ideas to defend their theory, the preturbers have now uh, gone to the absurd and stretched the, the translation of 2 Thessalonians 2.3 to say that the rapture must come before the Antichrist is revealed. Even though that is direct contrast to what Jesus in Scripture says, but let's look at it and see. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 2.3 Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed. Now, what they're saying is, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So it says, they're saying that the day of the Lord, the day that the Antichrist goes into the temple, none of that can happen until first there's a falling away. Now, that word falling away in the Greek is apostasy. And most of us know that that term falling away is the Greek term apostasy. And... Um, the, but they, the the pre-tribbers are saying this is a mis this is mistranslated, and should instead say the taking away comes first. So they want to plant the taking away in there for that day will not come unless the taking away comes first, and they want to say that that's the rapture and the rapture must occur before the antichrist is revealed and goes into the temple claiming to be God. Thus they conclude the church must be removed before an real persecution begins. So. This is wild, okay? They want to reword that one scripture because they're getting so whittled down. It, they're, they're coming to a, like a funnel. They're coming down to a place where they've had all these ideas that they put in people's minds over the last hundred years about the, the pre-trib rapture. And little by little, they're being gnawed away because they're not in the scriptures. So now they're down to this one, and they want to use this one to say that the falling away <clears throat> is actually the taking away or the rapture. And so they would read this, let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless the taking away comes first. 
the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes, exalts himself above all, is called God in that or that is worship. So they're saying, let no one deceive you, for that day, which would be the day of the Lord, <clears throat> will not come <clears throat> unless this taking away comes first, or the rapture comes first, and then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So they're putting us, um, that, that's, they're, they're, they're saying that Antichrist comes um, at the beginning of the seven years, and that that seven years, that seventh week of Daniel, is um, is seven years of tribulation. Again, it's nowhere in the Bible that there's tribulation during those seven years. So when they say pre-trib, they're saying we have to be taken up before the Antichrist is revealed. Well, first of all, uh, they may, may make a good point for mid-trib because the the guy doesn't go in the Antichrist, the beast doesn't go into the temple and claim he's God until the middle of the seven years. So now now you got another problem, but I, I don't even want to go there until I examine this because I, I really think you need to understand this because in the last days it's going to be um, it's going to be really difficult according to Jesus and um, and many people, I, I think actually in the back of my mind, I think that this whole pre-trib thing is going to create a lot of the falling away, a lot of the apostasy, because people are going to say, hey, wait a minute, we're supposed to be gone before this is the Antichrist. This can't possibly be the Antichrist. This can't possibly be the mark of the beast, because we'd be gone by now. So I, I think it's a, a dangerous delusion. It's a dangerous doctrine that's going to set up many people for failure. But... Um, It'd be real nice if we did get out of here before that. It's a real nice thought. But unfortunately, it's not true. Well, at least not according to Jesus or Paul. So, um, having been taught pre-trib rapture all my Christian life, and not wanting to suffer any real per persecution, I tend to want to <clears throat> their pre-trib ideas to work out. So, seeing this new defense for pre-tribulation, I thought to myself, could this be? And so, what I'm trying to tell you here is, is I didn't approach it like, oh, I have to prove my idea over theirs. I approached it like, could this be? It would be nice if we could get out of here early. It, it would be great. Um, I remember when I was a senior in high school, uh, your last year, uh, if you did your classes just right and you had a part-time job, you got out of school early. And I loved that. I loved when everybody else was going to lunch. And especially in the springtime, I was going out to my car. And uh, I'd love to get out of here early. It'd be great. But uh, so I, I thought, you know, maybe I better examine this. So knowing it was probably only wishful thinking, I decided to investigate it a little further. And actually, it did bug me for a while because I want to be correct on these things. So it did bug me that these guys had found this, this idea that the church would be taken out before, uh, b before this, uh, the day of the Lord, before the the. And, and don't get me wrong, I do believe we'll be taken out before the day of the Lord, but I don't think we'll be taken out before the Antichrist begins his reign. Um, and I believe the first half of the seven years, the first three and a half years, is going to be, um, it's going to be very political and very, um, oh, it's not going to be comfortable for us Christians. But the second half of the three and a half years, that's when it's going to get really difficult. That's when we're going to really suffer uh, persecution. The persecution in the first three and a half years, I believe it's going to be more uh, terribly inconvenient. Uh, you won't be able to to go to the stores and that sort of thing. But I don't think the mark of the beast will come until the beast comes. And the beast doesn't come until the Antichrist is almost killed and brought back to life by, by Satan. So I believe that's when he becomes a beast. And I've talked about this before. He becomes a beast because, um, because he's no longer human, because he gets some of Satan's DNA to keep him alive, because Satan sees him as his last ditch effort to try and take over the world. So, um, so uh, although I never would knowingly deceive anyone, I do want to be sure that I'm teaching what I'm teaching is correct and that it agrees with Scripture. Because truth be told, anyone can slip into a place where they search for scriptures to defend their theory, which unfortunately is where many preachers have already slipped to or landed. And um, in fact, a lot of them don't even know what they believe. They've just been taught the company, the, the company line, and that's what they teach. And they, they don't know, um, they don't know anything about it. They don't want to talk about it. So. Um, it's just like last week I talked about the Holy Spirit and how I had a pastor that 
was Pentecostal and, and uh, felt he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But he would never uh, try and pass that on to somebody else. He would pass them on to somebody in the church that, that had a better understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I think it's the same case here, is that the pastors typically won't talk to you about revelation in any great detail because um, they, they want to pass it on. And only those that, that study the company line real well and know the company line will delve into revelation and they'll teach it uh, from the company line perspective. But uh, it doesn't agree with Jesus. If you think of Jesus in, in the Oliphant Discord, laying out a general, if you remember this when you were... Um, when you're writing uh, papers in school, you'd, you'd set forth an abstract, and the abstract would give you a general idea of what the paper was going to be about. And so what you find is Jesus laid out the abstract. He laid out in very general terms exactly what would take place in order. And then when he met with John in heaven, when he brought John up to heaven, he, sp he would much more specifically told what was going to happen. And um, people have had to turn it into a lot of different... Uh, fairy tales to make it sound like their idea worked, but it, it's really actually pretty clear and plain if you read it through with the Holy Spirit leading you. You'll see that it's just an expansion of what Jesus talked about. In the first 11 chapters, uh, speaks um, specifically um, about, about some aspects of it, and then when you get to the second uh, 11 chapters, then you'll find that it's um, more detailed in exactly what's happening. So really a good plan, a good layout. You know, Jesus gives you an outline, then um, then he, he gives to us in Revelation, he gives us a revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit through John. He gives us a revelation of what's, what's coming down in, in general terms and then uh, more specific than he did at Olivet. And then, uh, then he gives into more detailed terms uh, the last bit. So it's really pretty plain if you read it that way. But anyhow, it's so easy for someone to slip into a place where they search for scriptures to defend their theory. And what you find, then you find a bunch of uh, collages. Of, well, this, you have to run over here, and then you have to run over there, and you have to run over here. And they don't just take you through Revelation like it's supposed to be read. <clears throat> but um, but many preachers are there now, and, and most of them won't most of them won't talk to you about it. But um, so, and for some it's real easy because they believe the church is taken out when John is taken up to heaven in the fourth chapter. So after that, nothing's relative to the church anyhow. So you could kind of say or do whatever you want. But anyhow. Um, but anyhow, these are those who conclude their theory is correct and go searching for scriptures to text, scripture text to prove their thinking rather than honestly searching the truth. Let me repeat that. These preachers that look for these uh, these scriptures to prove their to prove their uh, their way of thinking, uh, they have to go and find texts to prove the thinking rather than honestly searching for the truth. Um, you know, which is also why we have so much fake news in the media today. They have their uh, they have their scenario, they have their way of thinking, and then they they take you down a, a path full of lies, I guess you'd say, to come up with what their scenario is. But so keeping Second Thessalonians two in mind, I went back to the Olivet Discourse to see what Jesus had to say about this new theory of the pre-tribbers. And this is what I found. Now remember I said, Jesus gives us an abstract or an outline. So let's see what Jesus said before we try and start finding it in other places. Uh, I trust Jesus and I trust he'll tell you the simple truths. Um, but anyhow, we'll start with 24.9, Matthew 24.9. Um, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, let me talk about that. The love of many who will grow cold because of lawlessness. Because um, there's going to be heavy persecution. There's going to be uh, really heavy persecution going on because of the lawlessness. And we just began to see the very uh, cusp of this with all the riots and the burning of buildings and breaking and the just terrible lawlessness in in like Oregon and in other places 
uh, Michigan. There's just places where lawlessness has abound, and we can expect to see that more and more. I mean, we live here in the central part of America, and we live in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and we even had our riots here. They had riots um, here too, and, and it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty bad. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, you could just say the love of many being, uh, and I used to read it this way: the love of many. The love of my neighbors, the love of my co-workers, the love of these people that aren't believers, their love will grow cold. But you can't read it that way because the word in the Greek is agape or godly love. So it's speaking about the believer. The godly love of many will grow cold. So it's talking about people that uh, claim to be uh, Christians. The love of many, and it talks about brother coming against brother and people betraying each other. And um, the agape love infers that the godly love of many will grow cold. And that speaks to the church, I believe. So godly love grows cold. And um, so, but then it goes on to say in 13, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. In this gospel, the kingdom will be preached all over the world and witnessed all nations and the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. You notice he's not called the Antichrist there because he's speaking of Daniel the prophet and the abomination of desolation. So, um, but it says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. So we know that he's talking about the church. We know he's talking about the church because it says he who endures to the end shall be saved. Who's enduring? The people that have godly love, but their godly love hasn't grown cold. <clears throat> and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached all over the world. This is all prior to, therefore, when you see the abomination des desolation, this is Jesus speaking. He says, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be lawlessness. Uh, to the degree that, that the church will begin to lose their love, brother will be portraying brother, and, um, and uh, but he who enters the end shall be saved. Now that's important because Jesus says that over and over again to the churches in Revelation. He who endures will be saved, and he who overcomes is, is the specific thing that he says, but, uh, says in Revelation, but so Je Jesus is clearly saying that prior to the Antichrist being revealed in the temple, there will first be a falling away in the church, not a rapture, not a taking away, but an apostasy, a falling away. But let's see if there's even further clarification. Go to 2 Timothy 4.1. This is Paul's letter to Timothy. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's very strong words. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. It seems pretty cut and dry what he wants us to do. I charge you before the God and the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. <clears throat> but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. <clears throat> but you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of the evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. This does not sound to me like an escapism clause. It sounds like apostasy to me. It says that you gotta, that they're gonna, you're gonna be preaching the word. <clears throat> for a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now, who are they talking about who will not endure sound doctrine? <clears throat> well, it can't be the un unbeliever, and it can't be the secular churches, because they haven't believed and endured sound doctrine forever, for a long, long time. <clears throat> I think John Wesley would roll over in his grave if, if he saw what his Methodist church had become. But um, but they'll they'll search for doctrines that, that fulfill their own desires, uh, their itching ears, and they'll heap for themselves teachers, and they'll turn away their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That, to me, sounds like apostasy, not a rapture. And Paul was warning Timothy, this is what's going to happen. And then he turns around and, uh, and, and repeats it a little bit. In 1 Timothy, <clears throat> he repeated, this was kind of a repeat in 2 Timothy, but in 1 Timothy 4, 1, he says, now this... Spirit expressly says 
that in latter days some will depart from the faith, taking heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, it, this, is Tim, this is Paul warning Timothy. Why would we be warned if we're gone? Why would he warn people of this when we're not even going to be here? Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. <clears throat> this further defends that this Second Thessalonian thing is not a big jerking away or taking away. This is an apostasy. This is a great falling away that we're warned about. Again, falling away, not taking away. So what, what did Jesus say in Revelation? In Revelation chapter 2, to the angel of churches, Ephesus, right? These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden lips, seven golden limestands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. This is the church. He's talking about the church in Ephesus. You've done all these things. Nevertheless, verse 4, Nevertheless, I've said, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. You've left the agape. Just what we read about a little while ago, Jesus said about agape. What, what Paul was saying to Timothy. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, the great falling away. Remember where you've fallen from. Repent and do the first works or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He, he, Jesus re predicts in the church of Ephesus that there's a falling away. And they're falling away from their first love, from their agape love of God. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So what he's saying, <clears throat> he says you got some good things going, but you got this really one, really one really bad thing going on, and this falling away. So what's with this? Now, this is before chapter 4 of... Uh, of Revelation, where they say that that uh, that John being taken up represents the Revelation. I mean, the Rapture in, in Revelation four. Um, he's saying to the church in Ephesus, um, "You're falling away, and you've left your first love. But because you hate the Nicolaitans, and um, and and you're still listening to God, if you repent." And overcome, I'll give you to eat the tree of life. See, every one of these scriptures that I'm taking, and, and there's so many, many more if we had time, but it's, nevertheless, I have this against you. You left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works. I'll come and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. He says, I'm going to remove the lampstand, which represents his... Uh, in one sense represents his presence in the church. He says, I'm going to come and, and I'm going to take that away unless you repent. Because there's a big falling away. You've fallen away. Church of Ephesus was a huge church. I believe it might have been the biggest church. I, I don't know, maybe the church at Corinth was bigger, but it was a huge church. And, and God said, you know, a bunch of you have left your first love, but I'll give you another shot. I'll give you some more time because I believe you could repent and uh, and overcome just as he said earlier just as jesus said earlier to those who to those who uh endure to the end uh they'll make it through so again jesus speaks of falling away in the end times church and calls them to repent before it's too late so it's pretty clear that according to jesus and to paul this will be a falling away of people that are in the church but not truly christians and this is not the rapture of true believers so, you know, you, you got to really get narrow-minded and, and, and just focus on one scripture because if you start looking at other scriptures, um, it's kind of like the name it and claim it people that talk about how God wants you to have everything wonderful and everything good and big bucks. And, and, um, and I've gone through that cycle 30, 40 years ago. You know, they want you to have a big Winnebago and they want all your bills paid and all you got to do is send them some money so that'll happen. But uh, <clears throat> if you read the scriptures... <clears throat> 
how'd that work out for Paul and all the other apostles except for John? And John, it wasn't a good deal for him either. So um, I, I, I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know how these people come up with these goofy ideas that you have to really depart from Scripture. Um, God wants to bless us. He blessed David. He blessed Solomon. He blessed Abraham. He has a means to bless us, and we reap what we sow. Those are very typical things. And Genesis says that the sowing and reaping will keep going on to the end until God returns. So we can expect that there's going to be sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. And so um, be be aware of that. But it doesn't say that you're going to escape all persecution. Uh, we did ministry work in China. I spoke in in government churches in China, and there was a whole lot of persecution going on. Some some women in one town had been <clears throat> caught handing out Christian tracts, as we call them, their little scripture note things that <clears throat> tell you how to get saved. And we were told by the church that uh, the above ground church pastor told us that uh, these ladies were in an underground church, and every day they hung by their thumbs for eight hours a day uh, until they would repent of their of their handing out the tracks. I don't know whatever happened to them, but uh, that was something going on right when we were there. Uh, it wasn't any town near us, but we were told of it <clears throat> because they told us how dangerous it was to to try and uh, proselyze in the streets. Um, but even Jesus said this in Matthew 13 in the parable of the wheat and tares. He said, this is a little long, but I want you to see what it says. Another parable he put forth to them, saying the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while, the, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares, bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. It's very clear again. There, there's going to be there's going to be tares in the church. There's going to be fakers in the church. And the sad thing is, many of the fakers or the posers don't know. They don't know that they haven't truly given their life to Christ. They're they've just found a religion that they're content with and a pastor that they enjoy. And as soon as they don't enjoy him, they'll go to another church. Um, they they aren't really they aren't really founded in scriptures. They aren't really solid uh, Christians. And um, and it's apparent because you could see the tares growing up with the wheat and the tares and wheat look the same. But when it comes time for harvest, the tares never produce the, the wheat. So he says, don't gather them up. I'll send I'll send uh, I'll send somebody down to gather them up before it gets too bad. So he's going to send angels down to uh, to polarize and separate things. And, and I can go into Revelation and te teach you about where where this happens and where it's polarized and uh, it's further on in Revelation but uh, it, it's it's very convincing of what's going to happen it says God will send he'll send angels that will bring boils <clears throat> and everybody that got the mark of the beast is going to get these boils well my belief right now is that it's some sort of a DNA conversion that turns you into a beast and you're no longer human but they promise you a life without sickness, a life without, with, with very slow aging, so you'll live hundreds and hundreds of years. And they'll promise you all these things through these DNA modifications. You'll be able to have the, the speed of a cheetah and the strength of a lion and, and all these kinds of things will be promised to you. And we saw it in Genesis chapter 6 with the Nephilim and we saw how God dealt with that. He flooded the whole earth because the people become unredeemable because they're beasts. And there's going to be a point where DNA will be modified and... Um, and you'll become a beast just like the beast and you'll have the mark of the beast and uh, you'll be unredeemable but it says everybody that gets the mark of the beast the angels will send forth boils to so everybody will know who has the mark of the beast because they'll all have boils and it'll it'll be a disease that that uh, that that's not uh, that's not prevented by this DNA change so um, I don't know what will happen then. I don't know if they'll blame any living people without the mark. 
that they caused them this problem? I don't know exactly. I, I'm still studying this. And as we go along, more and more is revealed to us. I'm just amazed at this day and time um, that we're seeing these things revealed. We're seeing uh, one world order. We're seeing uh, snap judgments made overnight that have changed us and the world, that have changed uh, our relationship to Israel and changed the nations that surround Israel. I mean, I can't, I, I can't wrap my mind around that uh, about five years ago, we gave hundreds of billions of dollars in cash, which really hurts our financial system in America when we start handing out cash. We gave that to the Iranians to prevent them from building nuclears. They just took that money and built the nuclears and bought the nuclear stuff from other nations. And now we have a new approach. We're gonna, we're gonna deal with the Iran people again and we've offered them $3 billion. And their response to that $3 billion is they, they, is it $3 billion? I don't know, $300 billion, whatever the crazy number is. We've offered them more money, and their response to that was they bombed one of our outposts in Iraq. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's insanity. We're just living in insanity right now. But um, people believe the deception. It says in the last days, people will be easily deceived, and they're gonna be, they're gonna be deceived. But, uh, but it's repeatedly clear, according to Scripture, that the text in 2 Thessalonians 2 is not the rapture of the church, but it says in the Greek, but as it says in the Greek, it's an apostasy, a falling away that happens just prior to the Antichrist being revealed, going into the temple and claiming to be God. It's very clear. And uh, somebody would argue the other, the other idea or the other thought has to have blinders on, that's all I can say. They can't look at scripture and see the truth because it's so plain. And please forgive me if I, if I come across as negative and judgmental, but God in his word repeatedly warns against deceptive doctrines. The devil knows humans are weak and are always searching for an easy way out, a way to escape the coming persecution. And in this, these last days, this will become increasingly tempting, but dangerous for the true believer. So to combat this, God, our Father, our loving, wonderful Father, uses the scriptures to continually warn us of not believing or heeding these false teachings, but instead calls us to be like the Bereans and search the scriptures for the truth. This is, you know, if, if we say we love God, if we truly love God, if we can read and write, then we're, we're in the Word, we're in the Scriptures, trying to figure out exactly what's going to happen for us as individuals. The Holy Spirit will speak to each one of us. He's not a respecter of person. He'll speak to anybody that wants to search this stuff out. Um, and I encourage you to search this stuff out. In fact, in these last days, as these last days approach, I'm thinking the false doctrines, the doctrines of men in the church, can possibly more, be more damaging to the church than the world will be. Did I make that clear? In these la as these last days approach, I'm thinking the false doctrines, the doctrines of men in the church, can possibly be more damaging to the church than the world would ever be. So, let me read you some of the warnings that God has given us. Colossians 2, 8, 9. Um, <clears throat> be aware. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through the philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men. Be aware, be careful, be forewarned, look out ahead of you, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, the easy way out, and not according to Christ. Now I'm adding that easy way out, according to the basic principles of the world. What are the basic principles of the world? Try and find the easy way out. And not according to Christ, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. It, it, the letter to the Colossians, Paul is trying to tell them, look out, there's going to be, there's going to be some people that want to cheat you with their empty philosophies and empty deceptions. They want to cheat you, lest anyone cheat you. And what are they trying to cheat you out of? They're trying to cheat you out of being part of that principality and power that's over the devil on earth today. We're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus far above all those principalities and powers. They're beneath our feet. If we'd only react and respond that way, if we'd only pray and seek God and seek his word and seek the truth and then follow through, follow through with that truth and pray according to the scriptures, pray according to what God has called us to pray. 
Second Peter two one. But there also, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there were false teachers among you. Um, he's talking about you know the false prophets uh, in in the in the Exodus. There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetous, they will exploit you with deceptive words for a long time. Their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Now, what I'm saying here is these false teachers, there's, there's false teachers and there's teachers that are teaching false doctrines. <laughs> Two different things, maybe. Um, the false teachers, there's false teachers among us who are deceptive and, and they have destructive heresies and they, they're trying to feather their own nest. They're trying to do something for themselves. But then there's just, there's good teachers who have embraced these false doctrines. And my prayer and belief is that as we come down the pike and the church begins to suffer um, persecution in these in these last days and we grow closer and closer to Daniel's final week um, I believe these people's eyes will be opened up and I'm praying that their eyes will be opened up and they'll be able to straighten their ways out and straighten their truths out because if they don't they're gonna lose a lot of people they're gonna lose a lot of believers they're gonna say hey wait a minute pastor you promised us we wouldn't go through this and now we're going through it it, w w what's up here, Pastor? Have you been lying to us? The pastor's going to say, no, I, I didn't mean to lie to you. It wasn't my intention to lie to you. My intention was to teach what I believed in my heart was truth. But see, if they put on blinders and say, I, I'm going to believe this theory before I, um, before the scriptures prove it, or I'm going to teach this theory and I'm going to prove it by my own uh, little snippets that I pull out of here and pull out of there, then um, then you got a problem. You need your eyes to be opened. I need my eyes to be opened. I want to be sure that what I'm teaching is correct, but I try and teach nothing but scripture. I'm an engineer by education. I, I, my degree is in engineering. My postgraduate works in statistics. I'm, I want to make sure that what I teach is accurate and it's not mixed with a bunch of worldly thoughts or basic principles of the world. I want to make sure that it's scripture. So we see over and over again that there's going to be false teachers, there's going to be false doctrines, there's going to be false heresies, and um, they're, going to, they're going to be according to the basic principles of the world, the easy way out, the protect your hide way out. Um, and it's going to be, and we're warned over and over again by God to stay away from these things. But in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is going to continue to build his church. Jesus is going to tend, continue to build his bride until the bridegroom returns for his bride. He's going to, he's going to until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. Israel had their chance and... Um, and, you know, I don't know exactly what's going to happen to them. God's going to deal with them. But, but they're his family. They, D, Jesus' DNA that he got from Mary was the DNA of Abraham, was the DNA of Israel. And, um, and they're his brothers and sisters. And uh, some of them have been cut away. But not all of them have been cut away from the vine. It doesn't say they've all been cut away from the vine. But it says we were grafted in. And uh, it says if, if they could be cut away, then we could be cut away too. So um, the, the thing we need to do is concentrate on staying in ourselves. And where we can share with our brothers, uh, uh, Jewish brothers, we should do that too. They need to see that. And I believe as we get near the end, the big harvest, that their eyes are going to be opened up. Paul promised that in Romans, that there's going to be a time that their eyes will be opened up. And I don't know exactly when that is yet. Um, I'll have to study that more to discover where I think it might be. But I'll tell you right now, I'm not sure where it is, but they will, they'll they will get a chance. And um, <clears throat> and when, when the bride is ready, then he's coming back for his bride. And the bride is the church. And I could go into a whole teaching about the bride being the church and that that we become family through uh, marriage, through the marriage supper of the Lamb, through the marriage of Jesus, and um, 
and then celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. But um, in the meantime, Jude 20 says this, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You, beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the agape love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto, unto eternal life. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We give you the glory. I think we have... Um, I think we've covered this subject. I know that I was disturbed when I first heard it and thought, what if I've been wrong? And then I go back and look and discover that's not what Jesus said. It's not what Paul said. It's not what Jude said. It's not what Peter said. It was clear that there'll be a, a falling away before the Antichrist is revealed um, or before the beast is revealed. I think the Antichrist will be around for three and a half years before, uh, before the before he's the beast and we'll see how that plays out but father give you the glory and the praise in jesus christ's name amen